this is Jordan, and you're listening to the Code 7 Podcast Network. Warning. This episode contains the three A's of podcasting. Adult content, adult language, and awesomeness. You've been warned. Welcome to Within the Trenches, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live there. Hey, what's going on? This is Ricardo with the Codes of a Podcast Network, and this is going to be episode 339 of Within the Trenches, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live them. This uh, episode is sponsored by in digital as well as rapid deploy and as always a big thanks to all of the patrons for everything that you do for the new patrons that have signed on for those who have uh continued to um to support and do everything that you do thank you all so so much for it i appreciate it we've got episodes that are coming out like crazy a bunch of announcements that are coming up as well as dare to be great too all kinds of things with dare to be great too The schedule is complete. The uh, industry partners are joining up. We have the three diamond sponsors for the conference. And once this comes out, that information will have been out already. So I'll just go ahead and say it. A big thanks to diamond sponsors in digital, rapid deploy, and Evans consoles for uh, sponsoring. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. So just everything that you do it's going to be awesome there's going to be a bunch of stuff that's coming out the virtual expo hall is going to be superb so look out for that and all of the other information coming for dare to be great too now for my guest we've known each other for uh for a few years now and we've we've been in uh, a couple sessions together which were a lot of fun during imagine listening as well as open mic live so my guest today is uh tom and he's a retired communications director out of indiana Hey, hey. Hey, good morning to you, Ricardo. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Awesome. Uh, pretty well. Thank you very much. How does it feel to be retired, man? It's hard to tell. You know, like I said, uh, <laughs> we talked in the past that, you know, uh, one of the hardest decisions of the day a lot of times is to, is to decide which T-shirt that I'm going to wear. And that's only if I'm going out of the house, of course. So, you know, between, <laughs> you know, between all my house chores, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. But it's a gig. I will have to say that. That is good, especially to have a decision like that. I mean, I I can dig that. I can dig it. (laughs) 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 Now, (laughs) you you have like over 44 years of experience. And if I remember correctly, you you, so you started out in dispatch early on and then uh, continued in public safety and and, and doing so many different things. You and I had a conversation last week, but I want to go through your story and and talk about a bunch of different things, especially how technology has changed from then till now. Um, You were communications director out of Indiana here for a while, and and you guys also used uh, the the Text 91 platform that's that's available here in the state. Uh, So, you know, the technology from then to now and how to get, you know, different pathways to emergency services has changed. But again, with those 44 years of experience, I want to go back in time. And I want to know how you got into public safety to begin with. <laughs> well, that's a that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> let me back up a couple of years prior to that. Uh, I was working for a uh, basically for an, for an asphalt company. We were laying asphalt in the summer in the summertime. I was getting ready to be laid off, and uh, I didn't want to be laid off. I wanted a job that would continue on. So I was hired by our local street department to be a street sweeper, and then in the winter months. Uh, go with the snow plow drivers or do whatever needed to be done, of course, as you do as a general laborer with the street department. Mm-hmm. Just after that, in uh, in looking towards the end of April of uh, 1976, uh, they were looking for a another dispatcher uh, and someone to help clean up the records room. It was like probably a lot of places back in the day, you know, you had cards, arrest cards that you would make but uh, they needed to be re-alphabetized and some of the older ones taken and archived or whatever. So I was hired in 1975, uh, in May of 1975, to become a communications, well, at that time, 
it definitely was just a dispatcher, I would guess. A uh, communications officer would be a stretch, I think, at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where that's where I started uh, basically my public safety career is uh, being a com- uh, dispatcher and uh, was that was there until uh, the end of September and beginning in October of 1977 um, I went on the road as a police officer and spent then well till the end of 2011 uh, at the police department man so Okay, let's back up a little bit. Okay. So your your time before going into dispatching, and the only reason I want to bring this up is because I, it, it makes me think about a time when I was headed to dispatch. Uh, and, and this, so when I dispatched, it was in uh, Michigan. Started out in Florida and then ended it in Michigan, uh, in my home state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Actually, the the county that I grew up in. But I remember heading to dispatch once, and it was blizzard like weather, like the the road was ice uh, i couldn't see i remember having to kind of poke my head out a little bit to see a little bit better exactly. and i remember on the side of the road is a huge plow truck that is okay. flipped on its side and the guy who the driver is standing on top on his phone and i remember freaking out and thinking if he can't get through this how the hell am i going to get through this to get to dispatch <laughs> That's exactly, I mean, that's exactly right. In the uh, blizzard of 78, I believe mm-hmm. it was, um, it was uh, we were in uh, for four days until such time a uh, National Guard troop transport was able to come down a road that was uh, probably 50 yards from my house. And I had to walk out with another, another officer lived just, just a catty corner from me. And neither one of us could get into work at, at that point. And uh, yeah, it was uh, kind of desperate at <laughs> different <laughs> times, especially when you see the snowplow driver, you know, sitting on its side, that's kind of a bad deal. That, that's kind of that's kind of a clue is what we would say in the business. That gives you a clue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All I could think was that, because I made it, I ended up making it into dispatch and I'm just in this little four-door sedan and, and I, I made it. And I remember telling that story and I thought, man, the Lord really knew that I needed to get there to help anybody else who was out on the road because I made it. <laughs> yeah. Well, back in my, well, when I was a dispatcher back in 76 or 77, we had a pretty bad, we had a pretty bad uh, snowstorm and the road was, the road basically was closed. So people were being diverted, of course, into town, which was very fortunate for us, of course. So they had opened the National Guard Armory for those folks that, uh, to be able to stay there because of course you couldn't get anywhere on the interstate. So I had a lot of people coming in, just the same kind of thing. They couldn't get it. Semis were blocking and there's no, it was just horrible conditions. And uh, so, yeah, that's, it's kind of a bad deal. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, looking at the beginning when you're in dispatch, how was that for <laughs> you in the beginning? Like, can you, for, for those who are listening and watching, what, one, what was it like? Okay. But, uh, but two, what is it that you're looking at? Because I'm thinking about how dispatch was for me and the amount of screens that I'm looking at. But, but oh, what are you looking at when you we walked in? had uh, a lot of screens, which I guess would have been just one of those large screens like you used to watch eight millimeter films on. That would be the only screen that would be in my area at all, which would be down a hall. But mm-hmm. no, we had no computer screens. We had nothing. We had nothing except for a uh, we did have one at that point was, a, I believe, a CRT that was set up on the computer so you could actually see but it was the it was the green tone uh letters white and green and that would come across so uh if i was sitting sitting here where i am in front of me was a desk Mm -hmm. one crt was on there uh i had a phone that was on the right hand side up on a wall with i believe two lines and uh, a box of course a box of computer paper and a 2740 machine, which that basically was the computer and then the printer that was assigned to it. And uh, that was pretty much it. <laughs> a little room, people would come into our lobby, which not which wasn't huge, of course. Of course, the, the, our department wasn't very large, the actual space. 
but uh, people would come to the window. Then I'd get up and go over and see what they'd need. And then and to the just to the rear of me was our uh, what was called the records room, where we kept uh, case reports and things like that. But when complaints would come in, I had a sheet that was probably four inches wide by six inches long, I guess, something like that. And it was just called a general complaint sheet. I would have to write, you hand wrote everything, of course, uh, write their name, their address, what the actual complaint was. And we had three different hooks, six to two, two to 10, 10 to six. And you'd hang it on that particular hook. And the people coming in, the guys coming in from the road would then go up and look through and see what had happened on the shifts before them. So they'd get some idea of what was going on uh, in case something happened and they had to carry on with something. Uh, you were hoping that people were passing information on when the, the new shift came on, but that off times did not happen. <laughs> and, you know, there, at that time, there were uh, one person, uh, basic, or I'm sorry, two people in a car. We only had, I think, three cars. So it, it was a different time, no portable radios. And as I said before, we had uh, just uh, a few channels. So, and the other thing that was sitting there was also the Motorola base station. That was it. With one little microphone, you push the button. That was all. That. <laughs> I'm, well, trying to, I'm trying to picture all of it. <laughs> from where we were to where we are, it's, it's incredible. You know, you're still doing the same job. Mm -hmm. just, I, don't even, I don't think I even had a fire frequency. It was, ju it was only police and sometimes the ambulance. What was the call volume like? And how many hours were you working at a time? Was it just you there alone or were there others? No, there was just me. Mm -hmm. You worked you worked an eight hour shift. I and I really can't tell you the call volume, but compared to today, I, there just wasn't. You were lucky if you had a call, if you worked a Sunday, you were lucky if you got a call on any shift, whether that was six to two, two to ten, or overnight going ten to six. Uh, my shift was uh, two days on. I worked Monday, Tuesday days, Wednesday, Thursday night, and did a turnaround on Friday and worked two to 10. But I, I can't tell you the call volume, but it was, <laughs> com comparatively speaking, very low. Man. And each, as you know, each individual uh, locality had their own basic setup like mine. Maybe they had a base station and a, and a, uh, and a uh, microphone, mm -hmm. they would dispatch their own people. I mean, it wasn't consolidated like it is today in most places. Do you remember any of the calls you took during that time? Like any that have stuck with you or even some of the first ones? Like, I I'm trying to think in my, <laughs> in my head how, you know, if the call volume wasn't that much, I mean, you were still dealing with the same types of things, but uh, do you remember any of those calls? Uh, let's see. We, uh, not, not, no, there was not, not a particular thing that sticks in my mind with regards to anything that was either major, I guess at that point, you know, you had the same types of calls, like you said, um, uh, but, and I'm sure at some point that there was a, uh, I'm sure there were homicides or a homicide, uh, theft calls. And, you know, dog calls, things like that, that everybody gets and just wishes they would go away. <laughs> but uh, I don't, I can't recall, I can't recall a particular call like that when uh, I was dispatching, when I was a young police officer. Yes, we, there were, there were those very memorable things that stick in my mind, things that you think, well, how does that, how did that happen? Or how did we get involved with that? Or how does this, how does this family get by, by you know, un under their circumstances, let's say. Right. So, so you're, <laughs> you're there. Yeah. I mean, what was the, what was the training like then? What, what was the training like back then? And the reason I ask is because when I first started out dispatching, and this is 2001, even when I first started in central Florida at a small police department, um, I remember walking in and my, my trainer showing me everything. Right. And then we sit down, he takes a 911 call and I'm observing and then he turns around and says, okay, you're next. And I thought, what? <laughs> well, of course. Yeah, I'm ready. Fired up. It, uh, <clears throat> I understand now, it, in my jurisdiction at that time, there was a 911. Mm -hmm. There was an emergency line that you called, but we didn't have 911. I think 911 came in in uh, 68 or 69, maybe. 
something like that. Yeah, 68. <clears throat> and at one point, I know that there was one jurisdiction here in Indiana that was the first to have 911, but it didn't it didn't spread throughout the state for quite a while, for a number of years. And uh, we, we didn't have it. I mean, in my training, <clears throat> let's put it this way. My training was similar to what? to the training that you get with, um, I guess, as a young police officer at that, at that time. There weren't dedicated uh, CTOs, of course, or, 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 or FTOs. You just went in and you sat with the person, whoever happened to be there, and they trained you as best they could with regards to everything that you needed to know. Now, of course, at that time, it wasn't as uh, frenzied most generally, uh, as it can be now. Uh, so you had the opportunity to actually talk to the person. And you had, again, probably the most uh, intricate training would have been through uh, for IDACs, Indiana Data and Communication System, which you're aware of, but mm -hmm. a lot of people may not be. But it was uh, our statewide you know, entry point for case reports, runaways, uh, missing persons, and things like that. And that was probably the most involved training. Other than that, I could write. So I could write on that small piece of paper. I could I knew, knew how to do that. Take a person's phone number and uh, then hit my little, hit my one button and say, you know, whatever car or white unit, you need to go here. Well, that was, that was pretty much it, except for mm -hmm. calls and things like that. And alphabetizing my uh, arrest cards, things like that, gun permits. It just what you know it just wasn't as, as as involved then as it is now it's uh, it's involved <clears throat> excuse me and evolved as well is it better it's good to be able to share data it really is better to, uh, an easier job to share data now than it was at that point um, but you're basically doing the same job other than the fact that uh, those consolidated CPAT uh, the centers today have to do everything, have to do everything for everybody. And that was a lot different at that point when I only had one small municipal department to have to deal with. Yeah, it's you you take me back a little bit as you're talking about this, because uh, the, the permits and such, because I remember at that first dispatch center or a small police department, rather, um, <laughs> being in there and when it was tourist season, people would come in. And even those who were local, they would come in for bike permits. And I remember I'd have to fill out all of those bike permits and give them out and, and do all that other stuff, extra patrol. And yeah, you're, you're taking me back. <laughs> the same thing. We had uh, we had bicycle stickers. You had to come and register your bicycle. It was 25 cents or something. And you'd write down the serial number and all the information on the bicycle and who the owner was, give them the sticker and send them on their way. So that was that was another one of those huge assignments that I had to take care of. <laughs> so you, you end up moving from dispatch <clears throat> and uh, becoming a road officer. Yes. You know, how was that? How was that transition for you? Cause w when you're like uh, for, for myself uh, or at least those that I used to work with, you know, we would have people who would come into dispatch who um, were working in uh, like EMS or something. Right. And, and they would come in and say, well, you know, this is what we do out on the road. And we would say, well, this is how we do it in, inside. And your protocols out there don't work in here because we have our own set. So for, for, for what you learned. You're in a non-visual environment to yeah. dispatch. Right. It is a lot different. Mm -hmm. uh, going, well, <laughs> I mean, you, well, I told you how I became a communications officer or dispatch. Yeah. Well, the reason I became a police officer is because it paid more. I mean, that works. <laughs> but I thought, well, you know, it paid probably, I don't know. At that point when I was making, uh, as a dispatcher, I was probably making $4,500 a year, something like that, maybe 5,000 and being a police officer paid maybe seven, something like that. So I thought, Hey, why not give it a shot? But I did it, became a firearms instructor, went on to just, do all kinds of things and you know some years later in 2011 ended up uh, going to the uh, sheriff's office so, so that transition transition yeah the transition was good and i think it was 
<clears throat> I think it was good for the other road officers that I worked with because they saw, you know, they saw that I had been there and been a dispatcher and knew what to do. And if something came up, I could talk to a complainant knowing what information that somebody might need um, on the other end of the world, more so today than at that point, because, you know, being a, well, being a communications officer then was sitting there and dispatching the calls. Uh, the only thing I could do is uh, I could tell maybe the complainant that if you need to call, this is the known number to call, and this is the information you need to relay to the person that answers that call. Again, it wasn't a consolidated uh, uh, PSAP at that time, but that I think that was helpful. I think that was helpful for that end to be able to uh, be able to tell the communications officer on the other end, if you had to call, this is what they need to know. And, and the old salty police officers that I worked with, you know, they, uh, they didn't really care much for the communications end. It was just like, that was something that was there in the radio room. And, uh, but they didn't really care what went on or what we had or what we as a dispatcher or a communications officer had to know or had to do. They didn't care. They just took care of their things and went on about their way. But I tried to instill in them that, you know, you got to think about, you got to think about those things about uh, who, who the caller is and what they're relaying to the uh, communications person. So it was beneficial, <coughs> very beneficial for, for you to have that. Do you feel like, there should be more opportunities for officers to come into dispatch to learn more about what it is that's going on. We tried to do that. We tried to do that. We, we have tried to do that uh, with a lot of the departments in our county. And, and they have been sending uh, police, new police officers and firefighters uh, into, the, into our PSAP for, I don't know, probably at least the last two or three years uh, as part of their FTO. They do come in and spend... Uh, normally spend at least one eight-hour shift with us and see see exactly what is happening on that end. Because folks that have not been in a, in a communication center don't have any idea. When they're calling and we don't answer the first time, and then they call again and are becoming frustrated, they don't realize that we're like the duck on the pond, that our legs are going like this under the water, going as fast as we can, but we are trying to stay as steady and smooth going across that pond as we can, especially during storms and things like that. Um, you know how you know how crazy the centers can be, and uh, so now there is some that that uh, is able to give them some understanding of what's going in, what's going on in the communication center when when they are calling in, and also it helps a lot when they're out there thinking, oh gosh, I remember they were getting their asses kicked inside that center. And so I need to be just a little bit, I just have a little bit more patience with regards to the folks. Yeah, that's that's one of the big things is, uh, you know, having them have that patience when stuff is going on. I remember one time we had a storm because you bring up storms and we had a storm that was bad enough that wires and trees down all over the place that we were having a hard time catching up. And there was there was four of us in there for the entire county. Right. And we had a couple officers come in who ended up saying, Hey, we're, we're coming in. We're going to help you guys with whatever you need. And, uh, so they were just taking, uh, calls and just writing down where trees were and we were doing the rest. Right. And like within an hour or so they were done. They didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> it's like, Oh, Oh, look, that's uh, time to wash my feet, whatever it might be. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. If you can give them just a little bit of education as to what's going on on the back end, it really does help. I, I think we've seen uh, those folks that have come in and spent some time in uh, communications. Uh, they, they have a new respect for what we do in them. For sure. Now, you, you end up spending all these years <clears throat> out on the road and such, and then you come back in. You become a director of a communications center. You know, you've you've got the knowledge from uh, being in dispatch from the beginning and then out there on the road. Do you think having both of those aspects of public safety really helped out during your time as a director? Well, yes, I think so. I mean, you can you can go back to the time when I was a, when I was a dispatcher. And at that time, it was I mean, it was it was night and day with regards to then and what it was walking into the communication center uh, when I took over as a director. 
um, I told uh, the folks that were hiring me, I said, here's, here's the deal. I'm, I'm a police guy. All right. I, uh, I don't know as much about the communications end as I, as I did, oh, 30, 40 years ago. So I can help on the um, personnel side. But I said, as far as the higher end uh, technologies, I said, I'm, I'm just not up to speed with regards to that. And if that's something that you're looking for, I'm, I'm not the guy. I'm just not. <laughs> and they said, no, we really need somebody to come in and take care of those personnel issues and uh, kind of guide the center in that way. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot, see what happens. Man, so then you, you come in and, and you start working on everything. Now, now you say that, you know, they needed someone to come in and work on the personnel stuff, you know, was, and when I was working at the, the last dispatch center I was at, we had a patch where Morel was down, you know, we were trying to figure out how to get everyone lifted back up. Was that kind of how you were coming into this? Well, the the thing is, and to my surprise, uh, the next month it had already been it had already been predetermined. They were hiring five people, so oh. <laughs> and I came in at the very end of January, and about the middle of February of 2012, we had five new people. We had no CTOs. We had no. Uh, we just had people that had been there a while, and so that's what happened. We had to put. I said, I, I said, you're kidding, really, that five people and I just started here and I don't know the lay of the land. And they said, no, we're, we've got to get those people going. I said, well, OK. So I leaned a lot on uh, the senior communications officers and, and uh, it, it was very beneficial. If it wasn't for them, I probably would not have been there maybe two months because they helped me tremendously get through those everythings, everything I needed to know about the communication center. Um, they helped a lot. And to start those other five people, that was the other thing. We had to juggle where we were going to put five people at one time and get those shifts taken care of. Um, then eventually, of course, we started, uh, got CTOs, we got uh, trained CTOs. And uh, it, uh, it was what I would call challenging at the time. <laughs> And dealing with, and not dealing in police world, solely dealing in police world, you were now dealing with pol police, fire, and EMS world. And those were th three completely different animals. Um, and, and I think people, I think probably across, across the United States, I would guess, not just Indiana, but the same thing I would imagine holds true. Um, you'll find that uh, fire departments are pretty territorial. Um, they want their particular areas, and if somebody encroaches into their area, uh, things get a little salty. So um, it just was com it was a completely different world for me, and I just had to uh, figure it out and do the best we could possibly do. So you're you're coming in. <clears throat> <laughs> and and doing this, you've got five people, but now you're also adding all of these different disciplines, and there's all different types of politics that go in with that well, as well. You bet. Yeah. Oh no. It, as I said, if if we didn't, if I didn't have a lot of the backing of those uh, communications officers, um, I probably wouldn't have been there more than a couple of months. I really probably would not have. But we we were able to get things rolling, got on the right foot, got those folks trained, and. Uh, you just do what you have to do to the best of your ability. Um, so that's kind of the way that it was. How, ma how many years did you, uh, were you director then? About eight and a half. About eight and a half years. You stayed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. We, uh, we got through. And of course, as the things progressed, we changed CAD systems. We changed... Uh, emergency and medical dispatch system. We, you know, things changed and evolved. And uh, as we talk about those different systems that we have in place now, of course, uh, our uh, sheriff was very forward thinking and very, uh, very technologically based. And uh, once we got into uh, the different systems and the different, uh, especially the CAD system, he was wanting, he wanted to be on the, on the cutting edge. 
he always has wanted to be on the cutting edge of whatever project that we were doing uh, to work, you know, to work smarter and not harder. Uh, but uh, the codicil to that is the folks in dispatch, when we would say, okay, we are going to be the beta testing site for this, <laughs> for this particular uh, product, whatever it would be. It was just like looks of, oh my gosh, here we go again. Because, you know, beta testing, you know, things don't always work like they're supposed to work. So being the first, uh, being the first person in line um, was sometimes kind of painful. That did have payoffs at the end, but I would have preferred to be probably number three in line when we were going with a brand new product, that kind of thing. Something <laughs> somebody else had taken, had taken over the headaches that we didn't particularly need. So for for those who <laughs> for those who are watching and listening, there's a lot of people in the general public who watch and listen as well. Can you explain what CAD is and what it's like when you're making a transition from one system to another? Because I remember when we did it, and it was a pain in the ass. And there was you know we would have a few consoles up, one would be down, and then it would get crazy busy in there. And nine hundred one, where's your emergency? Or also, 911, where's your emergency? And do you have an emergency? And a lot of people would say, uh, no, wait a minute. I'm calling 911, right? And say, like, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the CAD system is their computer aided dispatch. Um, when somebody would call, if you're out there in the community and you call in, then they are going to the, the communications officer is going to take your information and enter it into the uh, computer aided dispatch system. And that's just the record keeping system for. Uh, that and now and now it has become not just that but dispatch is fire we have locution uh, that is also integrated with our computer dispatch system so that's automatic fire dispatching for you folks out there that don't know what locution is and uh transitioning from one cad vendor to another as ricardo alluded to it is sometimes challenging well i won't say it's sometimes challenging it's very challenging because you have data that you had from the prior community, the CAD system that you had and transferring it over into the new system does not go quite as smoothly as everybody hopes. <laughs> and as also as you alluded to, that's the same thing when you're bringing up a new, you know, whether it's the uh, Motorola Vesta system or whatever anybody might have with regards to that, any system change like that, there are, it's problematic. It just is. And everybody knows it's going to be, even if you have had a CAD system, the same one for who knows, five years, 10 years, and they go through an upgrade. That is also seems to be problematic. You only because there are certain files or things that you, that, that didn't get turned over, even though there might've been behind the scenes testing by the vendor and said, yes, we're all ready to go. When you put it in your environment, it may be a lot different because you're talking about, you're talking about different ways that uh, the systems are built on the back end. You might have your own system or you may be uh, part of a statewide system and uh, it's just different and the uh, files don't get transferred over and things become a little dicey. Yes, very. And for those who are listening and watching, the other piece of that as well is if you're upgrading your phone system, uh, in, in, in dispatch, when they're upgrading their phone system, their call handling uh, equipment. I So I remember uh, testing, working with the digital and testing that stuff out and being at, <clears throat> excuse me, at a dispatch center. And I don't know if I've told this story before for those who are watching and listening, but I'm testing and I've got uh, my coworkers who are testing on the other end. And they said, okay, we're going to send in a test call. And I said, okay. So I go ahead and I pick up, you know, 911, where's your emergency? And it was a real call. It was one that just happened to squeak through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Perfect. And, and, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and I I had just been out of dispatch um, and, and working for Indigital for maybe six months or something. So, you know, I still had, I don't know, I, don't know, I still have my skills anyway. Uh, I'll always have those skills, but... I was fresh out of dispatch and I'm sitting there and someone I they they're yelling already and saying, you need to get somebody out of here. She just hit me in over the head. We just got out of court right now. And I'm like, holy crap. And their CAD, their whole computer system was down at sure. the time because we're doing the phones. So 
I've got, I, I bust out a paper pad and a pen and, and I start writing everything down. Okay. Description, location, everything. And she was already gone. She wasn't in the area. He didn't need EMS. Uh, he just, she just kind of slapped him is all it really was, but he wanted an officer. So after I got off the phone and made sure he was safe and all and got her direction to travel, I look at the dispatcher that's there and I said, Hey, this was actually a real call. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, take this. And we've had to do that. We've had to, we've had to revert back to pen and paper, uh, different times when the system, when if we're going through an upgrade and they were going to have to, uh, they were going to have to do something, uh, uh, a lot more intricate with the server. They'd say, okay, here's the deal. You may be down for up one to two hours. At least uh, you're going to be able to stay up, uh, but you're not going to be able to input any calls and the people on the road aren't going to be able to utilize anything. So we would go to pen and paper and write things down. And then when we had the ability to come, the, when the server would come back up and CAD would come back up, we would then input those calls and that's that's just the way it happens. Sometimes it just happens that way. You know, even as far forward as we are now today, uh, we still have to at times revert back to the pencil and paper, pen and paper. Of course. And and that's something for those who are listening and watching to to remember as well is when you're calling in, if if for some reason, you know, things might be taking a little bit longer than you expect, it's probably because this type of thing is happening. Like you you have no idea, but maybe, you know, the, the CAD system has gone down and we're reverting back to, uh, you know, original gangster style, OG style, <laughs> you know, the beginning. <laughs> exactly. And people have to realize too, those folks that are out there just uh, in the public that haven't been either a public safety officer or in communications, uh, if you're driving down the interstate and you see a crash and you call it in, understand that you you know you're probably not the only person on the interstate driving along that's calling in that crash so if you're very if the dispatcher is very short and says to you you're calling about the crash at the 141 mile marker um yes and then you've disconnected they're not being rude it's just we've got to get the folks on the way get that taken care of and yes we've had 12 other calls before your call came in for sure yeah i i used to tell people all the time and and you know, someone might think I'm, I'm being a jerk, but I would tell them, you know, they're going as fast as they can to get to you. They're not just waiting on the other side. There are other emergencies that are going on all at the same time. Your emergency is not the only one, but we're getting someone to you as fast as possible. And a lot of times being real like that and straightforward, the caller would be like, oh, OK. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we do. We have those those folks that do exactly the same thing, but um, just want folks to realize that when you call in, you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes, no matter what you're calling in about. Maybe it's the maybe it's the prettiest blue sky, the most beautiful day, and you don't have anything going on in your world, and you're wanting to know about, you know, Aunt Mabel's cat. You're kind of concerned about that. Well, in the back end, you know, all hell may be breaking loose in our center because there is some other there's some other emergency on the other side of the county, and we're getting our butts kicked. Yeah, exactly. Or you've got you're in and, and this has happened to me before in the dispatch center but you've got you're in your county complex and someone just happens to bulldoze a main line or something and then everything goes down <laughs> yeah that's exactly right things i mean things like that i mean technology is great when it works and uh, when it doesn't then it just get kind of hamstrings you sometimes and you just you have to do the best you can with what you've got Right, exactly. And and speaking of technology, as we kind of segue now into this, you know, during your time there as well, um, you know, you ended up, you, you all ended up using, uh, you know, text to 911. And this is just another way for people to get into uh, emergency services when voice isn't enough. You've got this as well. Now, I, I would go to, let's just say, for example, the gas station, I just go to the gas station, and I would have at that time, my in digital uh, polo on, right. and they would say, "What is what is that? What does in digital do?" And and I would give them a scenario instead of saying, you know, exactly just a blanket of what I do. I would I would give them a scenario and say, you know, let's let's do let's let's think about if if someone ever broke into your house and you were hiding, you know, you want to get help, right? So would you call nine one one or would you want another way to do that? And they would say, well. 
you know, what, what other way? And I said, well, what if you had the ability to text to 911? And they said, well, why would I want to do that? And I said, well, again, would you want them to hear you when you're trying to call for help? And they would say, oh, I guess I never thought about that. Yeah. Th do we have something like that? And then I would say, well, at least in the state of Indiana, it's been around since 2013. <laughs> Yeah, there's no question about it. And I'll tell you, you know, you talk about and people across the United States, the different people that you talk to, mm -hmm. sometimes they think that they sometimes they think the folks that are from the Midwest, whether that be Ohio or Kentucky or Indiana, wherever, they think, you know, you guys don't, you know, it, we, we're on the East Coast, we're on the West Coast, we know everything. I mean, we're good. You guys are just in Podunkville. <laughs> and I said, you know, and I would tell people, does your state have text to 911 for, for all of the entities in your state? Well, not, I don't know, but I don't think so. And I said, well, there you go. Uh, Indiana was the leader for text to 911 and then the entire United States are the first state to be completely built out in texting to 911. And that's, an, that's a really important technology. It uh, has paid off big dividends. I said, so there you go. There you go. It's, it's huge. The I 911 board, uh, it's just, it's been, it's been great. It really has. It's been great partnerships. I, I know that, you know, through in digital, what uh, kind of great partnerships we've had with those, with the board. Yeah, they're, the board has been excellent. They've been, you know, forward thinking and just everything, how they do uh, what it is they, that they do. And it's, you know, their board, their top people are, they come from the dispatch center, whether it be law enforcement on the road or in the actual uh, center as a director and and such. So there's there's all of this that's getting poured into it. Uh, again, being on the the cutting edge and everything of of technology, you know, for you as uh, as if you can you know kind of think back a little bit. You know, do you remember some of the um, you know texting sessions that came in that your dispatchers are working with? Probably the third. I'm thinking the third or fourth call nine one one call that we came in. It was an actual nine one one call. Mm -hmm. And uh, the communications officer just had that, as, as they do, get that feeling that something's just not right here. So she utilized the text to 911 to contact that person back and said, is everything okay there? And the person was hesitant, but they said, yes. And she said, are you sure? You know, she typed back, are you sure that everything is okay? And the person paused and then typed back, no, things are really bad. It's been, it's a domestic situation. It's physical. And so anyway, she was able to send the police out there and arrest was made and, uh, things worked out better than your normal, uh, normal call that we, if we would have just left it and our communications officer would have just said, okay, uh, then that would have been it, but that wasn't it. And the result was good for that family. I uh, got taken care of a domestic abuse situation. And, uh, the other thing that you'll find, at least in the state of Indiana, I know people were thrilled to get text to 911 because we had so many butt dials. <laughs> and on the butt dial scene, somebody calls. And for those folks that don't know exactly what that is, you know, you've got your cell phone and it's in your back pocket or it's wherever. And all of a sudden it just automatically dials 911. <clears throat> Excuse me. We well, didn't know exactly what to do. So what we did. We before that we would call back. Well, nobody answers. Nobody answered their cell phone. They didn't care. They didn't know who was calling them, so they didn't answer. However, when text nine one one came in and they saw that uh, if we texted the back and said well, we're calling from the communication center, we're, this is from the communication center. Do you have an emergency? They would immediately, almost immediately, text back and say, "I'm sorry. You know, it was it was inadvertent. I didn't mean to." And no, I don't have an emergency here. And if you knew the situation was probably, if you could hear people's feet crunching under leaves or snow, you figured that, yes, they, they probably are okay. And it wasn't an actual emergency. If we had any question whatsoever, of course, we would dispatch somebody to their location. But those particular kinds of things became uh, almost obsolete with the text to 911. Yeah, there's... So there's a, there's a couple a couple things here that I that I want to mention. One is why do you and and well this is just a question to you. What do you think it is that makes people respond more to a text than a voice? When you're trying to call back, yeah, I dealt with that all the time. But I, when you're texting, 
text. I think texting, everybody has texting. They, they just do. And I think that they're, they're it's almost like a, a Pavlov response is that all of a sudden they get the text and immediately they pick up their phone and see what, see what it is. Phone calls, eh, not so much anymore. It seems like those people, those people that are uh, responding to the text know that folks that they like that are in their that are in their circle it might be one of those folks texting them the phone call that it could be a you know it could be a robo call it could be anything mm-hmm. text alert to them then they would immediately look at that i think i i think that's probably the reason i don't know that for sure but i'm just yeah it 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 almost seems like people think it it's uh it's more anonymous when it's I mean, it's really not, but because <laughs> we well, got your phone number. <laughs> but, yeah, but I think that I really think that's probably it. Mm-hmm. Sure, but because they're all the robocalling, it's just, it's just inundated with robocalls all the time. Um, I think that they know. They think that it's somebody that they know, probably uh, trying to reach out to them. Now, do you think it's a little harder when doing, um, you know, conversation in, in text to 911 or even text from 911 where it's, you know, dispatch is able to initiate a text uh, from uh, 911, you know, a session to that, that texter? Do you think that it's, it's harder in a way because the human element is kind of taken away where, like you were kind of saying, when you get a voice call and it's an open line, you can hear everything that's going on. So you can tell whether something is, you know, amiss or something. Sure, and, and 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 as you know, when the when the text of nine one one was coming to Indiana, the, the you know the voice is best. Voice was always best if you're going to contact the center via nine one one. But when you can't, that's when you should text to nine one one because, as you said, the voice will give you inflections, mm-hmm. It'll give you those clues in the background that you might hear that you wouldn't be able to, of course, hear on a texting session, but. Uh, yeah, I mean to have both of those options available is just awesome. It really is. I I fully agree with you. It's it's an amazing thing to have because I I, I think about when I was in dispatch and such, and and especially now with even you know location accuracy being so much better that that we're able to locate people instead of you know having a call come in and me there trying to get information or trying to find somebody trying to you know taking more time to uh get to one of the cell phone companies one of the providers to ping that phone to try to get a better location or something but now you know it's it's a lot easier oh sure it's it's a lot it's a lot easier and it is a lot better to be able to have you know sometimes are there sometimes they you know they would look and think are there too many tools in the toolbox you know, because we have so many systems and so many things that you're dealing with in the communication center. Um, but this this particular tool is is a gem. It really is. Now, thinking about all the technology that's that's happened from when you began in, in public safety in general, and then up to the point where uh, you, you retired out, um, with the technology that's coming in, you know, we're talking about text and I one right now, but let's kind of jump in a little further and, and look at um, just the aspect of mental health and wellness for dispatchers and call takers. You know, you've got video, live streams, pictures, all right. of that that's coming in. You know, how do you think that's going to affect uh, dispatchers and call takers? And as a you know former director, what do directors need to do looking into that future to help? their dispatchers and call takers to be able to handle all of that and manage the stress that comes from it. But overall, just as a, it depends on, you know, there are boards, there are people that are at least in Indiana or in the auspices of the sheriff's office. Um, as, as an entity, uh, the leaders need to take a look at a wellness program overall, just for all of their employees. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, to be in a center and be with a department that the sheriff was took the lead, not just here, but nationally, as an as an advocate for uh, wellness and uh, well being, all in all aspects, but especially in the uh, the wellness of mental health and trying to uh, erase the stigma 
that if something is going, or if you don't feel good or something's wrong, instead of keeping it bottled up inside, you need to, you need to talk to somebody. And if that's a, uh, if that's a friend, if that's a pastor, if that's a whomever, and that, if that doesn't work, we now, or the, the department has, has the option to actually talk to a professional and so many sessions will be paid for by the department. And that's the kind of thing that needs to happen. People don't realize, especially as we talked about communications uh, today, you're working in a, non, in a non-visual environment. If something happens, if you take a call and your child is choking and you help that person through, but yet the child might still be in distress, you oftentimes in the center have no idea what the outcome of that is. Or, or you know, God forbid a, a police officer, firefighter, or medic uh, be killed on the line of duty. And maybe you were the last voice <clears throat> that they had either on the radio or on the telephone. That's really traumatic uh, in anybody's business. But with us in particular, and as close as everybody is within that, uh, within the field, um, those things over time, even though you may not know it, if your coworkers see something, if your supervisor sees something, uh, it's incumbent upon those folks to take it to whatever level needs to be taken to, to get those folks help. Because you cannot bottle those things up inside of you for very long at all, or it's going to take a, a huge toll on your overall health. Uh, I, I fully agree. I, I think, you know, to, to your point, it, it also starts, it really does start at the top. You know, as long as your directors and everything are doing what they should be doing, you know, for all of their, their call takers and dispatchers, I think everyone is going to be okay. And I also think in a way, in a weird way, and people might hate <laughs> this part of this, but I think that because one of the big things is that dispatch doesn't get closure, right? We were just talking about that. You just mentioned that. They don't get the closure. We don't know what happens. But in a weird way, being able to see some of this stuff, I think will help a little bit with that closure piece. Um, then again, you know, there's a lot that ends up going through it. But I, I think knowing at least part of it will help with the closure portion. I agree. I agree. But that is a tough thing. You know, as we talked about in a non-visual environment, you take that call, uh, you have no idea what happened there. It might bother you. You may not know. Now, ultimately, you may be able to find out what happened. But to take a call of, uh, you know, we've had some pretty heinous calls. And to have that just uh, stuck in the back of your head and you think, boy, I don't, I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to look. I don't want to look weak. I don't want to look like I can't handle it and just bottle all those things up, that is a terrible, terrible thing. And uh, again, the department that I have been with is very forward thinking with regards to those things. That is awesome. And that's definitely what is needed out there. More departments and everything that are forward thinking like that um, to be able to continue to help dispatchers and call takers, you know, just sharing stories. You know, this I've been doing for a long time, just sharing stories and sharing stories. And as soon as you share those, you're able to, to uh, to handle and and manage you know it a, a lot better you know the the I am nine one movement uh, was really you know it started out as a reclassification issue and and it's still you know used for it for awareness but really it turned into peer support and and that was a, that was a big thing I, it's still going yeah we have uh, peer support teams within the department as well and let me just let me just stop for a moment mm -hmm. and talk about the I am nine one one movement. And what you have done with regards to the I am 911 movement and the reclassification. That's another one of those steps where, you know, those people in Indiana don't know exactly what's going on. Or the first state in the United first state in the United States, I believe, to reclassify uh, communications officers as public safety personnel and versus being clerical. That's a huge step forward. It's it's for uh, for morale. For folks to think, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not just a clerical worker. I am, I am with everybody else. I'm like a police officer, firefighter, an EMS worker, and that's the way it should be. Because I said, how long, how often do you see a firefighter driving around the street in his fire truck and see a fire, or a police officer that's going by someplace and see a burglary in progress? Those things, 
are just very few and far between. We in communications get all of that. Everybody calls and then we send the folks out. So of course we're first, we're the first responders. You know, that that's, I tell everybody, I said, I'm so proud of you because I said, you are the true first responders. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. And Indiana is definitely one of the first states, you know, Texas um, got theirs. And um, I, I believe Idaho, California is working on theirs. West Virginia um, has one out there. There's a gentleman named Jim Brown who has done excellent work out there. Um, and there's there's other states that are that are coming on and coming on. And uh, it's really good to be able to see this uh, happen and for dispatchers and call takers to get that recognition. Now, federally, it'll be awesome for, for that act to end up going through. But state-wise, all of these states that are doing this, it's amazing work. Um, as we go into the wrap-up of this episode, it's been awesome to have you on and talk about all of these things. You you brought me back to a lot, <laughs> to a few things that I remember. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I love it. It's, it's great. Um, now, you also do community outreach. So for those who are watching and listening, and, and as we go into this wrap-up of this episode, you know, for the community outreach piece, what is it that that you can give, you know, advice or whichever for those who are calling in to 911 when they have an emergency to make for both sides a, 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 a better, a more smooth experience? If they, uh, and what uh, one of the things I'm going to try to do, of course, I'm going to talk about some, some system, the new system that we're going to be implementing, as well as some of the things that we already have. Uh, I just want them to understand, especially the people out there in the in the different groups that we'll be speaking with, uh, that when you call in, please understand. You know, you know, and you know as well as I do, Ricardo, that at times when people would call in, they need to realize that first of all, we have a recorded message. Uh, the, the communications officers have recorded their greetings, so if they'll say, you know, the, people will try to talk over the initial greeting. So that's pretty important to know that you're going to hear an initial greeting. Then you have that live person on the line. So please, I, I understand that maybe you're in a, a that you're in a situation that um, that's what you feel is an emergency. That give that give that person time to answer, and then they're going to ask specific questions. And because it's scripted the way that we are, is it's scripted in a lot of ways. Please listen to what they're asking, and just go ahead and tell them. Don't become um, don't become upset. And, and just just go through because there are certain things that we have to ask and certain pieces of information that we have to get in order to get you the help that you possibly that you need. We've got to find your location. We've got to know who you, you know, where you are is, is the key. Because if we don't know where you are, then uh, that's, not, that's not going to do much good. But with regards to outreach, those are the kinds of things we're going to be talking about. Those the systems just make it just make sure when you call in that you're going. I'm going to tell them kind of how the call is going to go, no matter what it is, if it's an emergency or if it's just a standard, my neighbor's burning trash over here, whatever. But just uh, know that there are certain ways that we are going to answer the phone and certain questions that we're going to ask. And please, we may ask them twice because we have to verify the way that our system is. We need to, we need verification for those things so that we make sure that you're getting to the right, we're getting you the help that you need and to the right location. Awesome. Well, thank you again very much, Tom, for being on. This has been a lot of fun, and uh, I hope you had fun too, man. It was it was it was good hearing about all of this and, and learning about you, learning more about you, um, versus you know the sessions that we were in on together. Well, sessions, yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> they were all... because we talked about for the wellness portion. It is extremely important for those for those type of sessions to happen where you can bring up a story and someone can relate exactly to what that other person's saying, going, I'm not the only one. I am not the only person that's been through that. And it, it's good to hear and be able to uh, let off some steam. And uh, sure. that's, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. That, it's good things that you do, Ricardo. I'm telling you, the, no, thank you. the I am 911 initiative. Awesome. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. And I will be right back here with you for, for those who are watching Man, this was this was excellent here um, to to learn more about Tom and all and uh, his story, and yeah, we 
we were in a couple <laughs> a couple sessions for imagine listening and open mic it was it was awesome um for for those who are watching if you have any comments questions or you want to be a guest on the show you can email us and that'll be uh wtt podcast at gmail.com let me throw this up here really quick there it is wtt podcast at gmail.com you can follow us on twitter that is at 91 podcast you can like us on facebook that is facebook.com slash within the trenches podcast uh this episode is sponsored by in digital as well as rapid deploy and this show will always be free however if you're looking for any uh, bonus material um early ad free episodes early access to those episodes they come out a week earlier than everybody else gets them um there's also discounts to the store uh swag t-shirts behind the scenes series all types of stuff you can visit us on patreon.com slash wtt podcast and uh look at the different um offerings that are there as well so thank you very much to the patrons I wouldn't be able to do everything that I do without all of you as well as uh, sponsors. So thank you so, so much. And um, this can be viewed on Facebook and YouTube. And the audio portion can be heard 24-7 on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, your favorite podcasting app, and withinthetrenches.net. Have a good one, everyone. I'll talk to you soon.